Hi again, I'm uh, Len Rydell, the Executive Director of Blue and Gray Education Society, and I'd like to welcome you to our uh, weekly uh, Zoom chat um, uh, tonight with uh, Dr. Tim Smith of the University of Tennessee at Martin. Um, uh, Tim is, uh, uh, is going to be leading, uh, God willing, our first tour uh, post-COVID at the end of March, uh, and it's going to be a good one. It is a uh, uh, Grierson's Raid, and it is uh, going to be based on the research and so forth that Tim has done uh, in compiling and doing his book, uh, The Real Horse Soldiers, which he published a few years ago. So welcome, Tim. Um, we hadn't met before. We've talked on the phone a few times and um, uh, really had our first face-to-face -face, uh, in, uh, in the administrative stuff in the last hour or so. Uh, but I already feel that I know you pretty well. Uh, but for those who don't know you, uh, uh, your reputation has preceded you. Um, I've uh, seen your, your, your works. Uh, I've read sev several of them. They're outstanding. And uh, particularly ones on Shiloh, Champion Hill, and most recently on um, uh, Grierson's Raid. Uh, would you just take a few minutes right at the start, though? And for those who don't know you, Tell us a little something about yourself and how you became interested in the Civil War. Okay, thanks. Uh, good to be good to be with you. Um, been interested in the Civil War for pretty much all my life. I grew up in Mississippi, Central Mississippi, uh, which is basically between Shiloh and Vicksburg, right smack in the middle. And so, growing up, starting you know five, six years old, whatever, uh, we would go one way or the other. I'll, several times in in the year um in fact we would go to shallow so many times that it was you know shallow has this mystique about it and it's just something special about going to shallow and we would go and we'd been there so many times that we'd get to the sunken road and say well you want to walk that well we walked at it a couple of months ago or well we've been there a hundred times you know we won't walk this time and so it got to be more kind of just going for the specialness of going i guess but um at any rate we went to to vicksburg and shallow so many times and then of course we branched out to other other battlefields um more in you know the the western theater chickamauga fort donaldson stones river and and so on uh, when i was 10 years old my dad took me and my brother on a, a civil war trip up through virginia we started at petersburg and went all the way to gettysburg hitting hitting every one of the every one of the battlefields uh that those are those are special mm -hmm. memories so I grew up right in the middle of all of it. Um, my dad was very interested in history. He um, uh, actually was a history major um, in college before he went on to seminary as a preacher and, and so on. But um, he did a lot of genealogical work and finding ancestors that uh, uh, had fought in several of these battles. Uh, Shiloh, I kind of more... Um, you know, started my NPS career and so on at Shiloh. Never had any ancestors at Shiloh, which would have been interesting had I had. But um, had about four inside Vicksburg, uh, defending Vicksburg, and then another one that marched away with Loring at Champion Hill. So uh, lots of ancestors in the Vicksburg campaign, all of them from Mississippi, of course. Uh, so all that put together, uh, really got interested in, in the Civil War, learning, you know, about the battles that they were in, what they did, and, and so on. Um, also have a major interest in World War II history, uh, particularly the Pacific Naval naval history. And I kind of got off on that a little bit in high school and maybe college and so on. But very quickly, I came back to to, um, to Civil War history and, of course, through graduate school and, and so on. Um, uh, it's all I wanted to study and then, of course, made a, made a career out of it. So that's kind of how I wound up there. It's fascinating that you mentioned uh, – I was stationed in Guam back in 1980-81 and um, uh, always had a real fascination with that. And uh, Blue and Gray, about four or five years ago, we did uh, a Nemesis Central Pacific campaign and we did uh, Honolulu, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, those battlefields over there are just haunting um, as, you, as you walk around and, and follow through those things. It just, I, I'd never had a full fuller appreciation of what the people went through than I got back in the, the jungles of, uh, uh, on Anderson Air Force Base where, where we forced the Japanese off the northern end of the island uh, in, in taking the island back in 
1944. So I, that's something new I've just learned about you is is uh, this common interest in the in the Pacific. Um, we'll we'll get together sometime and talk about the Philippines and and Okinawa and so forth. But um, um, <clears throat> something that impressed me, of course, you mentioned that you were with the National Park Service and. I, I um, knew of your reputation uh, uh, at Shiloh. You put out a lot of works and so forth on that as you were working to get your doctorate and so forth. And uh, something that always fascinates me with people who get the terminal degree, I, I got a master's degree and never never went further, but usually people who get a, get a doctorate have something that burns within them, something that burns in their system. Um, what is your... Uh, if, if you have a philosophy or perspective on the Civil War, what is your um, professional perspective on the Civil War and its role in, in American history and world history? Well, um, obviously in American history, I, the, the Civil War is, is the central event of our history. You can't understand uh, what came before it without understanding the culmination of it. You can't understand what's come after it. Uh, without understanding the causation uh, of the Civil War. So uh, it's it's obviously the central event, and obviously the role that uh, the United States plays in the world today um, is, is, uh, is defined by our power and our, uh, our history. And again, the Civil War plays a, a defining role uh, in that. So uh, the study of the Civil War, a lot of different facets of it, the, the thing that burns in me um, is the military aspects of it. Um, and, you know, you talk about, my wife would probably call it an obsession, I don't know, but um, it's it's one of those things that I just can't wait almost every day to, to get to the researching and the writing. And, and, um, and of course, life gets in the way a lot of that you have to work and you have to raise kids and 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 do a lot of other things but it's a it's a passion more more of a passion than an obsession i guess the uh, the the writing and the research and and uh, and all of that fortunately as we discussed a little bit earlier uh, a lot of my classes are online so i have a lot more time to uh, to put into that uh, uh, fortunately so that's that's a passion a burn of mine you know, uh, I've been in this business now for, oh, going up on 28 years and um, have met a lot of people. Uh, my wife was in academia, you're in, in academia and so forth. Um, do you think, uh, especially in view of so much that has gone on in uh, reexamining history and so forth in the last uh, few years, do you think uh, the academic uh, discipline is fairly addressing the importance of the Civil War, or is it tending to get the back of some people's hands? Well, there's a couple of different ways you could look at that, I guess. Uh, a lot of the study these days, uh, particularly dealing with history and military history, uh, wars uh, in particular, uh, are going to World War II and Vietnam. And you can kind of understand that because what we're seeing now with the World War II generation and even some of the Korea, obviously, and, and even up into the Vietnam generation, uh, what's happening to them now and them passing off the scene is exactly what was happening to the Civil War veterans from the 1890s up through the 1940s, 30s, and, and 40s and so on, uh, when the heyday of Lee's lieutenants and you know, Bruce Catton and, and all of that um, occurred. And so since the centennial, probably, and a little uptick in, in the – uh, the 80s, maybe in the 90s, and so on. But it's it's been steadily going down. If you go to any bookstore, Barnes and Nobles, or or uh, Books a Mean, or or whatever, you used to see shelves labeled as Civil War, um, and now you don't even you don't even see you know hardly a section on the Civil War. And so I think uh, academia and publishing is moving away uh, from the Civil War, and I think it's not helped in some degree. And I'll probably get some pushback on this. I'm a purist of a military historian. I don't get into a lot of the social and, and so on, but it seems almost with some publishers, particularly academic publishers these days, that if you don't have the subtitle uh, race, gender, and equality in lower 
Marion County, South Carolina, or something like that, in the subtitle that you, you can't get it published. A lot of the, the studies um, that I'm guessing nobody reads, maybe a few read, I don't know, um, are going in the social slant and, and studying, you know, the, the people and, and, and uh, infrastructure and all that behind uh, the war. And that's important. I'm not knocking it. That's, that's fine. If you want to write on that, that's fine. Uh, but for me, uh, what's getting the, the back of the hand is the pure military history, uh, the battles, the battle studies and, and so on, the, the campaign studies. And um, that's almost a dirty word now in, in academia. You know, there are very few um, uh, departments that are filling military history positions. You know, if they have a military historian uh, and they retire or leave, then they're filled, you know, by uh, some, other, some other position. And you even see that in the NPS, the National Park Service. I know numerous national parks that used to have a historian on staff. Uh, that have, you know, those historians retired or went to other positions or whatever, and uh, those positions are never filled. So a lot of parks these days, particularly out west, I can think of here, uh, don't even have historians. And that, uh, that I think, is a shame and is a picture of where we are in terms of uh, the study of the Civil War and academia and all the rest. I think... Um... Yeah, you know, when you when you talk about that and you, you you look at what it is in fact being published, it seemed to me um, I get a, an awful lot of books to to review and stuff from the presses, and there seems to be a real distinct uh, move towards memory. That seems to be the buzzword memory in everything, um, and um, I I think this thing of memory, of course, is is an interesting discipline. Uh, because it's it's something you can't logically argue with. Uh, all history is ostensibly what we remember it to yeah. be and what it, value we attach to it. But and the thing that I think distresses me about, about uh, the reluctance to deal with military history, I, w I went to the Society of uh, Civil War Historians Conference in St. Louis a couple of years ago, and was amused to have a see a panel discussion that the theme topic was should the study of civil war include military history, <laughs> and 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 it was a knockdown drag out. I mean, there were there were a couple of uh, professors who had curriculums in which they had very much marginalized the military aspects, <clears throat> and it focused just specifically on the social uh, and economic mechanisms of the war with the, the war itself being secondary. It, it was very distressing to see that happen. Um, in looking at what's going on and, and seeing what's published and stuff, what in your assessment is robust areas for study in the Civil War beyond the military history and or including the military history. What else do you think really needs attention out there that isn't getting it? Well, the, the old saying is, you know, you can't find anything new um, to write on about the Civil War because it's all been, been written on. Uh, and that's simply not true. Um, I've made a career almost of, of writing on different topics that have already had a lot of attention uh, but focusing on, on specific areas, uh, for instance, in uh, the Shallow book, Conquer Parish, uh, nobody had really done much of anything on day two. And I spent half the book on day, day two at Shallow um, at Corinth, in the Corinth book. Um, nobody had really done much of anything on the siege of Corinth in May. Uh, and I spent nearly, nearly half the book on, on that. So there are a lot of areas, major areas. Uh, that still deserve attention, um, and some of the old tried and true places that's uh, um, that's that's been covered. You know, we get a book or two on Gettysburg every week, it seems. Um, but you know, Vicksburg and Chickamauga, we've we've seen new studies coming out, um, and you know, just because there are major good studies that came out 20, 30 years ago, doesn't mean it's time not time for a uh, for a for a new look, and you can do it with with new ways of of um, 
of research. You, know, you can incorporate, uh, obviously, a lot of military historians now are incorporating the economics and the politics and the society and, and so on. Um, and you can incorporate the, the soldier life and, and you know, the human interest type of, of thing. And so there are a lot of different different areas that... Uh, that, that you can you can work on so it's by no means a closed field uh, there's still plenty of areas that that you can that you can look at um, some are growing bigger obviously the um, uh, the memory that, that we mentioned uh, a lot of people are doing that in terms of uh, military history looking at the at that through the lens of memory uh, a lot of people now are doing um, environmental type stuff you know weather and and uh, um, uh, infrastructure and, and terrain and, and uh, uh, mud and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, a lot of different ways to, to look at this, and that only adds to our knowledge of, of, um, of the Civil War. So I welcome all of that. I just don't want it to become so prevalent that pure good old-fashioned military history is thrown out, you know, the baby thrown out with the, with the bathwater type thing. Sure. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in looking at different areas of, of, of publication, you uh, picked up on, on something that was of real interest to us. Um, uh, you may be aware that Blue and Gray for years has been doing um, uh, an eight-part, 32-day uh, analysis of the Vicksburg campaign based on Ed Barr's three-volume set, and something we always... Um, found ourselves wringing our hands over was how to deal with Grierson's raid and, and so forth. Um, uh, Blue and Gray magazine had tried nobly, but wasn't a whole heck of a lot of help. And um, we generally found ourselves just, just folding in a small portion of the raid um, um, down around Hazelhurst and so forth, and just picking up that, that latter portion of the raid and folding it into uh, the latter part of the tour. Uh, you wrote this very detailed volume on Grierson's raid. Uh, what inspired you to do it? Why, what interested you that made you want to do Grierson's raid? Well, uh, a couple of different things. Again, living right in the middle of it. I think I mentioned in the, in the preface maybe or the introduction or wherever to the book, I've lived in a lot of the different areas uh, that Grierson went through. I lived in Pontotoc County, very near Cherry Creek in, um, in uh, New Albany. Um, went to school at Mississippi State in Starkville. Had uh, my grandmother uh, lived in Neshoba County in Philadelphia. Uh, my other grandparents lived just south of that in Union, down, uh, down near Neshoba. Uh, all of my family was from Newton County and Neshoba County, and some from down to Smith County, Raleigh uh, area. So, so uh, you know, the places that Grierson uh, went to and was involved in all of this uh, were my backyard. And so anytime you can have a personal connection like that, it's, it's very important. Um, and I will have to admit the other thing that really interests me in, in this uh, is John Wayne's movie, The Horse Soldiers. I love the movie. It's not very accurate, but I love the movie. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very entertaining, and I still watch it quite often. Sure. And so uh, living in the midst of it and being interested in, in the Civil War, watching the movie and, and all of that, it just, uh, it was a no-brainer. Surprised it took me uh, this far along in my career to get to it, actually. Uh, along those lines, um, uh, I realize, you know, with all the writing you've done on it, you could talk about that for hours and hours. But how about giving us a thumbnail sketch of... Uh, Grierson's raid from its inception through its uh, uh, conclusion, and what, in your opinion, made uh, the raid important? Well, uh, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of the raid itself, but we have to go back a little bit before that uh, and look at why the raid is even attempted. And it all comes out of the fertile brain of Ulysses S. Grant, obviously by February, and really the the seed is planted in, in early February. Um, Grant is wanting to take attention from his movements and operations down uh, along the Mississippi River, and particularly in Louisiana, the Canal, Lake Providence, uh, all of that. Um, and so he starts writing his uh, go-to guy up in Memphis, 16th Corps Commander uh, Stephen A. Hurlbut, 
uh, about sending this raid down into uh, into Mississippi. And over time, it morphed into what ultimately became Greer's and Drake. Um, it looked somewhat different uh, initially when they started talking about it. Uh, but eventually, uh, it took the form that, that it did in, um, in mid to late April of 1863, uh, which was exactly the same time that Grant was moving south west of the Mississippi River through Louisiana and beginning his movement across uh, at Bruinsburg and then, of course, uh, on up, um, up to Vicksburg. So um, the way it, it shook out in terms of mid uh, to late April is that this diversion that Grant had thought about and perceived the whole time uh, could play an especially important role uh, in terms of taking Confederate attention at the critical moment when Grant is moving southward and going to be crossing uh, the river. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Gerson leaves uh, LaGrange, Tennessee on, I believe, the 17th. Um, it's been three or four or five books ago. I have to refresh my memory. Even I'll probably read the book before we do a, a tour again. Um, but he leaves on the 17th, moves southward through Ripley, New Albany, Pontotoc, Houston, Starkville, Mississippi, his intention is to hit, well, really a couple of intentions. Number one, to hit the, uh, the Mississippi Central Railroad uh, somewhere around Newton or the, the Chunky River. Uh, that will cut Vicksburg's only supply line uh, into and, and out of the, the greater world, the bigger world. Uh, but the bigger intention is to take Confederate attention away from Grant. Uh, and he absolutely does that. Did a little bit. I'm not a big, big proponent of quantitative history, uh, but I did a little bit of, of uh, number crunching in this. And I, I, you know, I didn't go to Pemberton's uh, ledger books and all that, the National Archives, which are, by the way, uh, online now. But I did go through the official records. And I think out of something like 70 messages that Pemberton sent uh, in the basically five days from when Grierson suddenly popped out on the railroad at Newton Station on the 24th uh, until Grant crossed the river on the 30th. Um, for those five days, Pemberton's messages are running about 90-something percent dealing with Grierson rather than dealing with Grant. And so that, I think, illustrates very clearly the attention um, that Grierson took uh, for the Confederate High Command. Now, once Grierson popped out at Newton Station, surprise to everyone uh then the question becomes how are we going to get out of here and of course um some thought well we turn around and go back the way we we came out uh, that hole had closed and so Grierson moved south and it really becomes a, a really an adventure story at that point uh, the whole thing's an adventure story it's almost like lewis and clark you don't know what's around the next bend of the river type type thing um but the the rest of the story is trying to get away and get out of Confederate Mississippi and get to Union lines. Ultimately, uh, he, he moves on down to, uh, to Baton Rouge. So um, really, really important in terms of the larger Vicksburg campaign, but fascinating uh, in terms of the adventure, the, the human interest and in, in the adventure story that it is. Uh, for a lot of people, Colonel Grierson has been embodied. You mentioned the horse soldiers and Grierson's been embodied by John uh, Wayne and uh, uh, Colonel Marlowe, um, who was Ben Grierson, and uh, would he have been happy with Wayne's representation of him as Colonel Marlowe? Why? Well, um, Benjamin Grierson was nothing like Colonel Marlowe. He, he was not a railroad engineer, um, didn't lose his wife, you know, to the surgeons that he hated and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, he was actually music teachers, musician of all things. He was an artist. He was a, uh, he was uh, very theatrical and in reading the book, if you, and if you're going on the tour, I very much uh, suggest you, you read the book. Even if you're not going on the tour, buy the book and read it. But um, the, the, a lot of theatrics on the, on the, the raid itself. And um, as Grierson, uh, if he could come back and watch John Wayne's movie, I think he would have a couple of, of opinions. Number one, well, they got that wrong. They got that wrong. They got that wrong. You know, a lot of a lot of it is very inaccurate. Uh, 
But on the other hand, I, I just have an idea Grierson probably would have liked the way he was was portrayed a little bit as this rough and tough Colonel Marlowe for one thing, but but the the theatrical uh, aspects of it. He loved theater and he loved music and he loved acting and, and all of that. And uh, I think he would have gotten a kick out of it. And Grierson never took himself too seriously. He he was he was not uh, one of those you know that that had his uh, his stars shoved up his, well, we'll, we'll go there, but, um, you know, he, he never really took himself too seriously, uh, and he got a kick out of a lot of different things, and I think he would have gotten a kick out of, out of John Wayne's movie. Uh, Warren uh, asked a question. He wanted to know, was it true that Grierson almost missed his own raid? <laughs> yes, it was. Um, he actually was home on leave. Uh, Hurlbut had sent him home to Jacksonville to see his wife and kids, uh, and told him I'll, you know, telegraph you when it's time to, to come back because they were they were waiting to coordinate this, you know, with with Grant's movement. And so uh, Grierson gets this telegraph, uh, telegram. And he's he's playing in the floor with his kids in the hall, uh, and the, the rap on the door, and the, the wife goes to the door and gets the telegram, and she basically says, "Ben, here's your orders." And and he leaves immediately, and he has to take the railroad to the Mississippi River and the St. Louis, uh, and then he has to take the steamboat down to Memphis, and he meets Herbert again. Then he has to take the 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 train. Uh, Herbert has a, a special train waiting for him. Um, takes the train out to uh, to Lagrange, and basically he gets there with just hours to spare. He gets there during the night of the 16th slash 17th and they leave about dawn on, on the 17th. So he gets there with just hours to spare, uh, very little time to plan and coordinate this of course is, uh, is, uh, uh, orderly, uh, Woodward and, um, and others have been planning this, but, uh, he just dang near missed it. And had he missed it, we would be talking about Colonel Edward Hatch, uh, leading, uh, Hatch's raid rather than Grierson's raid and how it would have turned out. I don't know. You know, uh, <clears throat> I was um, I was very impressed with with the book that you wrote. I like to um, I read a lot of books. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, I read a lot of books, and um, I like to categorize books as either Velcro books or page turners. And a Velcro book is a book that is so dense in content. Doesn't mean it's a bad book. It just means you have to spend a lot of time on it, page after page, analyzing everything that's on the page. And what I found in a book that admittedly I was skeptical about initially, uh, we talked about this program some time ago, and so then I had to read the book to determine what was it I was signing on to and stuff. And I was remarkably impressed with how easy the book was to read without being a dumbed-down book. It was not a a book that um, <clears throat> was overtly simplistic, nor did it try to make the raid into a lot of complexities that perhaps people would not have fully understood. When you were working on the book, uh, what two or three things about the raid most surprised you? What what popped out that, that you just didn't see coming? Uh, and as you got further into it, you said, hmm, that, that enhances my understanding of what I want to say about this raid. Uh, well, one thing would be the, just the sheer uh, volume of Confederate attention placed on it, uh, which only leads me to believe, you know, and, and talk about its importance mm -hmm. to the larger Vicksburg campaign. You can't take this, this out of context. And, you know, a lot of people get their history from the movies and, and so on. And if you just watch John Wayne's movie, you'd think the uh, breaking the, the railroad line at Newton Station was, was the, the key factor here. The only thing, you know, that, that doomed Vicksburg. But uh, really, that was almost a sidelight. And the railroad was back running in you know, a couple of weeks or so. Um, but the attention taken, uh, and I, I never really realized just exactly how deeply that was and, and how important that was uh, right at this critical moment where Grant is, um, is, is moving across the river. Um, another thing perhaps that, that surprised me was just how bold and almost suicidal 
this thing was. I mean, you moved down into Mississippi several hundred miles and expect to get out of here intact. Um, that, that's a pretty bold plan, and, and it's just amazing that, uh, that Grierson pulled it off. You know, some I thought was very fascinating um, that you mentioned that um, uh, and you talk about the decision and, and how uh, Grierson – uh, sends out detachments from his main body uh, with with missions to turn the Confederates' heads even upon itself from here to there. And there, there are points in which it looks like perhaps Grierson is going to turn around and return to Tennessee. Uh, and he does have offshoots that, that lead people to believe that. But ultimately, of course, he continues on and moves, moves on south. Um, you know, and it's not surprising to me because I've seen a lot of raids, Stewart's raids. Stewart faces the same thing on his ride around Lee and or around McClellan in '62, uh, when Lee doesn't necessarily want him to go completely around. He just wants him to find out where um, where McClellan's vulnerable and to come back and tell him. And the decision is that there's less problem in front of me than there is in the hornet's nest I've stirred up or the red ant nest I've stirred up behind me. And so it seems that the path of least resistance is to keep going ahead. And um, ultimately, you know, we know what, what happens with that. When you look at Grierson, though, and you look at all the little bits and pieces, the, the things that flagged him on the, um, on the campaign and the decisions he had to make, especially in trying to cross some of the rivers and so forth, would you say that Grierson was successful because of his leadership or because of the Confederates' uh, confusion or lack of leadership? Uh, I would say Grierson's leadership because the Confederates, as I said, Pemberton puts uh, 90% of his attention and a whole lot of troops in Mississippi um, on the task of catching Grierson. And, you know, Mike Ballard talked a little bit about in, in his biography. Um, that you're, you've got a little bitty raid opposed to the great big grant invasion. And Pemberton focuses on the little bitty raid, but that's the tangible threat. That's the one in Mississippi right now. Grant's still across the river. And so, you know, there's a lot of attention being paid, and particularly when you get down uh, to the Hazelhurst, Macomb, Liberty, um, down into Louisiana and, and uh, all of that. Uh, there are Confederates. Uh, you know, coming at Grierson from every different compass point and some in between. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a Confederate reaction uh, in terms of, you know, the Grant versus Pemberton. Obviously, Grant had the, the upper hand there. Um, so I think it, it was in large part Grierson and, and the decisions he made, uh, the ability to deceive you know deception is a major part of uh, of warfare uh, you know the military the, the principles of war and, and so on you want to surprise obviously um, and you know the Gulf War why did those Marines uh, you know act like they're going to make an amphibious landing why do we have the battleships bombarding you know the the coast at, at Kuwait uh, and then the main thrust comes around, you know, the flank out of, out of Saudi Arabia. So uh, deception is a major part of this. And Grierson is, and I think this is where some of the theatrical aspects of, of his life that he enjoyed this, uh, he's putting on a show. This is, this is the, the performance of a lifetime that Grierson is, is acting out here. And, um, and the deception that, that he, he uh, uses and so on is just absolutely remarkable. So, I'm, you know, I think a, a lot of the credit has to go to Grierson. Um, in March, um, one of the things that, that um, uh, really enticed me when, when we first were getting to know each other and talking on the phone, and I asked what you, you could do and what you were interested in doing and so forth, and Grierson really, really teased me a lot. And some of the things that you told me at that time said to me, man, I got to get that tour. I got to get that done. Uh, how are we going to make that happen? And um, as you may remember, I was rather persistent. Uh, I was willing to throw some things overboard because I wanted to get this Grierson's Raid thing done. But um, for people who don't really understand uh, how this raid could be 
an interesting, exciting ride for them to participate in. Could you um, uh, maybe tell us how you have succeeded in putting together uh, a fairly accurate route, whereas so many others before you failed? Where are your milestones, your your mileposts, and what two or three or four things uh, really anchor you to the route that you're you're planning to take on this? Right. Um, well, anybody goes on the tour will obviously have to, to keep the bigger picture in mind that this is a five or 600 mile horse ride, basically that we're going to do in two or three days in a van or a bus. Um, so we're going to be moving. And my philosophy of these tours, and actually, even when I do a Shiloh or Vicksburg tour, um, obviously there's a lot of commentary and interpretation by me. Uh, but one of the things I like to do is to, to let the battlefield speak for itself and let the the terrain speak for itself and you know i'll explain things and, and so on but um you know i could do a tour on or a talk on shallow at your round table um and you might enjoy it so on. but that's not the same as you being on the shallow battlefield and me you know telling a, a little bit about it so on. so this will be the opportunity to be on the the actual ground the actual route as best we can tell now 100 percent of it you can't tell some of it's been lost um but there, there are two major uh, pinpoints on the map, if you want to, um, <clears throat> if you want to call them that, uh, that help us know where uh, the route actually is. Uh, number one of the towns that Grierson went through, and, and he was very detailed in his report, and he went through, you know, downtown Pontotoc, downtown um, uh, this one and, and that one, Hazelhurst, and, and all that kind of stuff, and um, and you can go to those towns now most of them, the bigger towns like Pontotoc or, or so on, uh, the downtowns are still in the, in the same, same places. Now, some of the smaller towns um, like Montpelier, Mississippi, have completely moved. Uh, there is a Montpelier, Mississippi now that was not where Montpelier was then. Um, and you learn where those, those towns used to be. Uh, Union, where my grandparents uh, lived, um, has moved now downtown union today is probably two or three or a couple of miles or so west of where union was uh at the time and, and as, as Grierson went through it so um you can you can hit those different areas as you go through um through the raid tracing tracing the raid and that gives you a pretty good idea of of uh of where you're going the other thing uh that you can pinpoint mostly uh, are the plantations where Grierson camped every night, uh, most every night, he would find a, he had this kind of inner sense that he could find plantations. And of course you get forage and feed and, and all of that, uh, food for the, for the horses and, and men and so on. And so he'd find these plantations camp there, bivouac there, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for each night. And Grierson was very, and this is one of the things I've thought about doing other raids and so on, but you, you just don't have the, um, the information there on some of these. Um, but Grierson was very faithful to tell us every plantation almost that he camped at uh, by name. Now, sometimes he got the name a little bit mixed up, um, like the McAdory Plantation down in, uh, in Smith County on the Leaf River there. I think he, uh, I forget how he spelled it, but the actual name um, is spelled differently, and it took a long time to, to figure all this out. Um, I did a lot of census research in these names, uh, and unfortunately, Mr. McAdory um, had come into Mississippi from Alabama after the 1860 census, so the census wasn't, wasn't any help. Um, other places uh, in finding these plantations found most all of them. Some of them have been, um, have been completely obliterated, uh, but found most all of them in a couple of three counties. The courthouses uh, have been have burned. Um, and uh, the explanation I always get is that, you know, courthouses contain records and they can, records can convict you. And so the best thing to do to remove the records is to burn the courthouse. So a lot of the courthouses burn. Um, so if you have land records and I found, I went to every courthouse that had had records in, in these counties, Pontotoc County, for instance, and, and, um, and Neshoba County and so on, um, and you can find where these plantations were. Now, at times, uh, Grierson was not quite as detailed as maybe he, 
we would like him to have been. Uh, for instance, I think it's in, if I remember correctly, <coughs> excuse me, Kapa County. He said he, he uh, camped at the Thompson Plantation. I believe it's the Thompson Plantation. So I get to Kapa County. I believe it's Kapa County. I have to check on it. Uh, go to the, the courthouse, and actually the guy there that's register of the deeds or whatever, very interested in this, told him what I was doing, and he, you know, he helped me out a lot, uh, but found two Thompsons that own plantations, and so you got to pick, you know, and I think it's actually Jacob, it's Jacob Thompson, I forget the actual name, but but two possible ones, so you you plot these on the maps with the range and township and all that, and uh, one is right smack on the, the route that Grierson is taken and the other is slam off in the other end of the county. So, you know, that's not it. And so, you know, this is, this is the plantation where you stay. Um, looking at census records at slave schedules, how many slaves these plantation owners owned and, and so on. Um, also cemeteries, these family cemeteries, several of the plantations, the, the plantation owners are buried right there on the plantation, right, right by the, the plantation house. Um, and you can find those cemeteries and so on. So we'll visit a whole lot of those cemeteries, those plantation sites um, that are documented by land deed records in the county courthouses and, um, and by, uh, of course, the cemeteries and so on. So uh, once you, you get the, the individual towns that he went through and in between those, the plantations that he stopped at, uh, you can get a pretty detailed route of where person went and looking at the 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 major roads you know he, he actually talks about he uses the colton's 1860 map of mississippi um and you look at that map and you can see uh where kind of the the roads take a detour and go this way or that way or or so on and you augment that even with uh with primary sources you know some guy writes a letter home and says we came through pearl valley mississippi or we came through uh this or or so on so uh there's there's a lot of evidence of where they went and we will track the vast majority of it. And are most of those roads, uh, uh, are, are we going to find a lot of modern roads or, or uh, you know, the Vicksburg campaign has got a lot of the original road beds and so forth. We spent a lot of time doing that. Have right. you found in yours that you'll be going uh, on a lot of original tracks and original road beds? There are places where we will do that. Um, on the other hand, there are places where, uh, you know, you, you have the, the various layers of roadways, you know, Interstate 55 going through Hazelhurst, Brookhaven, down to McComb and so on. Um, right. It's not on the, the old road that was uh, Highway 180, 80 goes east-west. What was it? Uh, 51 made, no, 51 farther, whatever, rail, whatever road it was. Uh, and that may not even be in the original roadbed of the original road. So, um some of these we will that are definitely, and you'll you'll see, and this is why we don't need a 55 passenger bus. We can't get them into some of these areas. Uh, but on other occasions, and it's a it's a fine line. You know, we've only got what three days to do this in. If we if we went 15 miles an hour down every farm road for 500 miles, we would make it in in three days. So uh, it's a fine line. We will see a lot probably of of uh, both as much as we can of the, the former of the, the original. Okay. Uh, the, um, uh, one of the uh, questions Bob Jenkins wanted to know um, your assessment and looking at the raid, um, what, what impact did the raid have on the, on the morale of the, uh, of the Mississippians, perhaps the, uh, the state government, the army, uh, Pemberton, uh, what, what impact did it have on morale, uh, communications, um, uh, supply? Uh, I know Newton Station was cut briefly, was that fairly well, fairly quickly restored. What, what is your assessment of the, of the uh, military uh, impact of the raid? Well, the military impact I've already talked about with Pemberton, the Confederate High Command is is in, and I liken it to to Pemberton's heads just on a swivel, and and you know he's so confused by by late April, early May of 1863, um, and so that that's the real military uh, impact there uh, for the people of Mississippi. This is an absolute embarrassment. It's you know how on earth um, 
well, liken it to current events, and we're not getting into which side of politics anybody's on and so on, but how on earth did people get into the United States Capitol last week, a week ago? You know, and and people are calling for heads about, you know, we weren't ready and all that. It's kind of the same thing in Mississippi. How on earth does a small Yankee column move through the entirety of Mississippi from northern border to southern border? How on earth does this happen? Um and even more embarrassing that we didn't catch them. Um, and it, it's it's an absolute embarrassment. And it really, and I think what it does, it shows just kind of what a hollow shell the Confederacy is. Uh, and we see that in, in a lot of other instances. When Grant breaks through at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, there's nothing to stop him till he gets on down, you know, to Pittsburgh Landing, basically, Savannah area. Are there any, uh, are there any recriminations for uh, – for, uh, the Confederates, uh, any heads roll as a result of um, uh, Grierson's no, success? No, because things began to move. You remember this is late April, early May. Uh, Grierson doesn't reach uh, Baton Rouge, I believe, until May the 2nd. And by that time, Grant is across the river, moving through Port Gibson and up to Jackson and then over to Vicksburg. And, you know, we've got bigger fish to fry than how this Yankee brigade made it through Mississippi. But it's an absolute embarrassment. Um, Paul uh, had a question for you, and this is a this is moving off the um, off the raid itself. But um, I've heard this question asked before, and it's always interesting to hear how different historians uh, uh, look at it. He he uh, has always read and believed that the West was the decisive theater of the war, and um, he wanted to know what your feeling was. Was was the West truly decisive, or was the war won in the East? Oh, I think I think it, the West is where it was won and lost. Um, and the, this is the way I teach my Civil War class. Uh, to me, the war in the East is basically a stalemate for four years. I mean, the 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 war is basically fought in a box between Richmond and Washington and Chesapeake Bay and the mountains. Um, back and forth and back and forth. Now they'll spill over a couple of times north of, of Washington, Antietam and Gettysburg, uh, spill over south of Richmond, you know, Petersburg and, and so on. But basically uh, for four years, they just go back and forth and back and forth and nothing really changes until obviously the lines are broken at Petersburg and Lee surrenders. Um, in the meantime, out West, Union armies are marching through the heart of the Confederacy with all of the railroads, all of the slavery, uh, food production, all of the, the supplies, all of the morale, the, the, the Confederate uh, wives writing their husbands saying, you got to get home and protect us. You know, who cares about the army anymore? Um, all of that is, is basically gutted by Union armies for four long years. There's no stalemate whatsoever in the West. And so, to me, it the it, you know, if a wash tub's holding water, um, and around the top is is still you know in the east, it's it's still uh, together and so on. But you, the bottom's rusted out of it, and, and the bottom's torn out of the tub. You're not gonna hold much water. And so, to me, the the in the west, the bottom is torn out of the tub, and that lets all of the the water out of the Confederacy and and. Uh, and it's a done deal at that point. I'd like to, um, uh, you know, time really flies when you're having fun, and I've got about five or, or six minutes or so before we want to wrap up. Um, so I'd like to close with two, maybe three questions at the most, um, depending on how you want to answer them. Um, uh, the first one I'd like to ask was, um, uh, you know, we know that, that, in the, the manner in which the raid was conducted, Grierson is in proximity to the area where Grant ultimately crosses the Mississippi River. They're not there exactly, uh, but they're there within an echo's range of that. Do you think, in your opinion, was uh, Grierson ever looking to join or cooperate on Grant's operation, or was he going to egress the theater regardless? Yeah, once he leaves Newton and decides to go south rather than <clears> going back out the way he came, 
um, his first intention is actually to go find Grant and, and to combine with him. He is part of the Army of the Tennessee, after all. And so, uh, actually, and it's kind of ironic how it all happens, he thinks he's a little bit late. And obviously, there's no cell phone that you can track Grant, you know, by his cell phone or, or something like that. And so, he hurries. And that's why we get this major hurry um, uh, from Garlandville through Raleigh and, and across the Strong River and the, the Pearl River there. Uh Grierson trying to, to, to get there because he thinks Grant probably has already crossed and, uh, and he needs to, to go ahead and get there. Actually, he runs a little too early. And uh, had he slowed down a little bit, uh, Grant, by this point, is not crossing. He, he reaches the area that he needs to be, what, the 28th or so, 29th. Grant doesn't cross until the 30th. Uh, so at their closest point, they're about 30 miles away. But, uh, but Grierson's just a little too early. And by this point, all of the Confederates are starting to converge on him. And Grierson doesn't have the luxury of time to just sit and wait, you know, like a running back. If you watch a running back, sometimes rather than just hitting the hole, they'll stop and they'll they'll just kind of wait for things to develop just a little bit. And once things kind of open up, then they'll they'll take off. Um, Grierson doesn't have that luxury. He can't stop and and wait for things to develop. He's he's and, and by this point, like the the thirtieth or twenty ninth or thirtieth, uh, he's got to make a decision whether I'm going to go to Grant. And I've heard nothing out of Grant yet or whether i got to get on the Baton Rouge, and he chooses to go to Baton Rouge. Um, you had mentioned a little earlier, um, and I noticed it in your book, but I think it was it's something that probably at the end of this is, is an important point to focus back on again. Uh, you said it could have been Hatch's raid, that Grierson almost missed it. What was it specifically about Ben Grierson that – made this and made him the man to lead this raid? Why was it that Grant wanted him as opposed to Hatch or somebody else? Well, Grant, in particular Sherman, <clears throat> had had a lot of experience with Grierson, uh, particularly in the Mississippi Central Campaign, which I'm writing on right now, um, and with Van Dorn's raid chasing Van Dorn and, and all of that. Um, Grant had not been terribly happy with some of his commanders, Jacob Misner, um, and even Albert Lee and so on. Sherman was really impressed with Grierson and kept feeding Grant these lines about how Grierson is the best command, cavalry commander I've ever had and, and so on. Uh, and Grant soon realizes that Grierson's got the, the, the right stuff here, uh, thinks on his feet and, and so on. And so Grierson, uh, Grant actually, um, he doesn't order that Grierson does it, but he makes it very plain to Hurlbut that he wants Grierson uh, in um, – in command. It takes Herbert a little bit to, to catch on because uh, Herbert doesn't want to lose his best cavalry command on what seems to be maybe potentially a suicide mission here. You know, let's, let's send Misner or Hatch on this, but, um, but he gets, he gets the memo very quickly that uh, Grant wants Grierson to lead this and he does. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, obviously since, um, since, uh, you have written the definitive work. <laughs> I don't say that modestly or, or to uh, blow smoke at you. I mean, it's a great, great read. But uh, could you do, a, as a wrap-up, would you just um, basically give us a critical path of, of your view of the, uh, of the essential literature of the campaign? Uh, well, you know, obviously I'd start with my book. Um, or the campaign or the, the raid? Uh, well, the raid, I, the raid, okay. basically. Right. Yeah. Um, I'd start with my book and I'd even watch the movie. I, you know, nothing wrong with watching, watching John Wayne, as long as you remember, it's not very accurate. It's, it's good for entertainment purposes. Um, there've been a, a series of small books written. Um, uh, and I would have to look on my shelf to, to tell you all the authors and, and so on. Um, one I believe is like one of the Osprey uh, series books and and so on um the major book before mine obviously was d brown's uh the famous um uh, wounded knee you know my heart at wounded knee um same author there he he wrote the book back in the 50s i believe um and so uh, you know beyond that it only gets you know a few chapters in books or or uh, you know blue and gray magazine article or, or, or something like that. So it's not just a whole lot of literature out there. Uh, you do get into some of the more fictional stuff like um, uh, 
the horse soldiers book by um oh, what's the it's on the tip of my tongue whatever the the guy that wrote that and it, what's the movie's based off of you know it had marlo as the character and, and all that kind of stuff but uh, as far as ray goes it's not just a whole lot out there um and to me the the real story had never really uh, been told and we could get into the, you know the whole story of d brown and all that he's more of a of a novelist than a historian and he uh, admitted you know I'll, I'll take liberties and and even fabricate some conversations and so on you know nothing wrong with that he says um and to me i'm a little more old school i guess than than that so combining the john wayne movie with the, um, the earlier books and so on i wanted to tell the, the the actual story and thus we have the real horse on it well that's great well tim um uh we've just a uh, few minutes before nine and i'd like to um uh go ahead and and uh wrap this up by thanking you to take the time uh, to sit down and chat with us. Um, uh, you know, I, in 27 years of doing this, well, heavens, I've been deeply involved with civil war for 30, 35 years or more. Uh, but in the last 27, 28 years, I think the thing I've really appreciated is that the widespread of, of um, what people know and, and um, how they present that. And I think, that you've really put forward a, a, a first rate um, uh, piece of the puzzle for people who want to understand the Vicksburg campaign. And uh, for those who would like to join us, uh, we're intending to do this program COVID permitting at the end of March. Um, I'll post up the, um, uh, the, the agenda and itinerary here in the next couple of weeks and uh, look forward to having you join us. Um, uh, certainly it will be a first. It's first for us. And as I understand from you, uh, that you have not done this uh, previously uh, for a group. And so this is kind of your first group tour of Grierson's Raid as well. So I think we'll all go out and have a bunch of fun together. For all you folks who joined us, thank you for your patience. Uh, I hope we'll get better and better as we go on further uh, with this. And for those early historians who are having to endure me and endure the the froggy voice, the next time I won't have an hour long conversation with you before we start. Uh, I guess when you get a little older, you, you start to lose your voice. So thanks very much, everybody. Have a good evening. For those of you who are interested, uh, we will send out uh, the transcript, uh, the video of this. You'll be able to watch it again if you'd like uh, in about two days time when Karen gets done with it. So thanks very much, folks, and uh, have a good evening. Next week, we talk about the seven days with um, uh, Dr. Paul Severance out of Fort McNair uh, in DC. Thanks and everybody have a good evening. Good night, Tim, and uh, thanks uh, so much. And we'll see you later, good night. Thank you. Bye.